Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm FTA's Executive Director, Matt Welbus, and I want to welcome you to this bus testing program listening session today. It's been six years uh, since FTA made some notable changes to the bus testing program. And since then, there have been even more changes in the bus industry, especially with the expansion of electric and low emission buses. And so to you know, reduce the climate pollution uh, effects and make transit cleaner with carbon neutral fuels, uh, about a decade ago, FTA invested uh, $90 million in research funding uh, to support advanced technologies for lower no emission buses. And along with uh, bus industry investments, uh, the federal support was one of the con key contributing factors to really launching uh, the low or no emission bus industry in the US as we see it today. And now here we are in 2022 uh, with billions of dollars uh, being invested in clean energy buses. And so last month, uh, you know, when FTA announced over $1.6 billion in grants for new buses uh, made possible by the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, that uh, really was a transformative moment. And so that investment uh, is going to help put, uh, help transit agencies put about 1,800 new buses on the road, uh, of which 1,100 will be electric buses. And so the grants from that one year are going to double the number of electric buses uh, in service. And this level of funding is guaranteed uh, each year of the next four years. So this is an exercise we will all repeat uh, as an industry in the coming years, which is very good news uh, for trans travelers, uh, but also for the industry. And so it's a really important time and a very good time for us to re-examine the federal bus testing program. So I think we view ourselves as your partners in making sure that we have you know, the best possible rolling stock uh, out in service in this country. And so our goal right now is to enable uh, the bus testing program uh, to be contemporary, uh, to support safe, reliable, and clean buses uh, using innovative practices. And so we do want to work with you, uh, the stakeholders uh, who you know, run this, who have this industry underway, uh, to really find ways to improve the bus testing program. Uh, in particular, we want to understand where we might be able to provide more flexibility uh, that would allow you to bring buses to market faster, new models. So you have uh, unique insights uh, that are very valuable. And so during today's session, uh, please do share uh, your comments and ideas with us uh, as we prepare to develop proposals uh, for future improvements to the bus testing program. Uh, it'll really help us enhance uh, this effort. And it's one of the ways I would note that you can share your insights. I hope you're in regular dialogue uh, with FTA's bus testing team, uh, with the team at the bus testing center uh, to give us uh, your knowledge about how we might strengthen the program. So I think we're all looking forward to this dialogue today, uh, how we can keep the bus industry strong. And uh, with that, I just wanna say thank you for joining us. I'm gonna hand it over to uh, FTA's Office of Infrastructure Safety and Asset Innovation Director, uh, Mohammed Youssef, whose office uh, manages the bus testing program for FTA. Mohammed. Thank you so much, Matt. Uh, really appreciate you being here for this webinar and welcome everyone. Uh, this is Mohammed Yusuf again, as Matt indicated, uh, the director for the Office of Infrastructure, Safety and Asset Innovation. Um, input from stakeholders like you has been instrumental in several significant enhancements to the bus testing program in the past. More recently, you played a key role in the development and rollout of an online bus testing portal. The portal has streamlined submissions of and responses to requests for determinations of testing requirements and authorizations to test a bus model. Today, we are seeking your comments and ideas again on what you would like to see improved in the bus testing program ahead of so many innovations and other things that we see in the market. The webinar announcement included a list of topics that FTA is particularly interested in hearing your comments and suggestions. We will review that list again a little later in the webinar. Now I will introduce Marcel Belanger, the bus testing program manager to continue with the webinar.
Uh, welcome, and thank you for participating in today's stakeholder outreach and listening session on the FTA bus testing program. I'm Marcel Belanger, the uh, FTA bus testing program manager. Um, FTA uh, will review and consider feedback that we re received during this session and from many follow-up comments. And we intend to use that to identify potential improvements to the bus testing program. And we intend to issue a notice of proposed rulemaking amending the bus testing regulation, 49 CFR part 665 in the future. And stakeholder participation and contributions like today are valuable to FTA's efforts to enhance the implementation of the bus testing program. As we mentioned in our announcement uh, of this event, uh, we have several topics that we're particularly interested in seeking comments on, uh, topics that we would like to hear but are not limited to include um, testing requirements for buses built on mass-produced chassis, um, expiration dates for bus testing reports, definitions of terms and failure classifications that we use uh, in the program and the regulation, um, the scoring and the pass-fail criteria, uh, the testing procedures that we use, um, the responsibilities of transit agencies, uh, which are FTA recipients and bus manufacturers, the administrative procedures that we operate the program under, the structure, presentation, and contents of bus testing reports, and uh, the weights that we assume for ballasting test buses that we, um, both for ambulatory and wheelchair passengers, and uh, the permissibility of modifications to a bus already in testing. And if we permit such modifications, uh, whether any corresponding modifications to test procedures should be implemented. In the listening session today, uh, which will begin in a moment, uh, we're gonna call the names of commenters in the order that they submitted their comments by email uh, in advance, according to the meeting announcement. If anyone submitted multiple submissions, we'll call them individually for each of those submissions. Uh, each commenter will receive um, several minutes to read and explain their comment uh, I think we'll have time if someone needs to go a little over the three minutes that we can do that, but we ask you to be respectful of everyone's time. And we'll still consider any comments submitted that couldn't be read because the session ended before we got to them all. Uh, if all the speakers that submitted comments in advance have finished their allotted time and there's time remaining in this listening session, we may allow speakers to raise their hands uh, using the functions in the webinar. Uh, to be called on to provide additional comments or clarification. And we're gonna be in listening mode only during this session. Uh, we could provide some limited clarification or explanation of existing procedures, but we're not able to uh, directly comment on the statements that you make today or um, debate them with you. All right, now our, our first uh, listener that we would like to call on is, I hope I pronounced this correctly, uh, George Despotes. And I will unmute you. Um, I didn't come up with him in the search, so I'm going to um, try uh, unmuting everybody if I can. No, I didn't work it. Is. So um, please bear with me as I. As I search for it. All right, it appears Mr. Uh, Despotes is not online. Um, if, uh, if you join us later, you can, um, you can raise your hand. 
Um, our next comment was received from Scott Crawford. Um, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay, great. I'm sorry. Uh, hi, my name is Scott Crawford. I uh, am a longtime transit user and I use transit all over the country. And I happen to be a wheelchair user. And one of my comments was that uh, modern power wheelchairs tend to be extremely heavy. Mine is 430 pounds empty, empty. So with an average size, you know, adult, it's at least 600 pounds, at least. So the question I have is, what can we do to ensure moving forward that bus lifts and ramps are specked out so that they can accommodate heavier users and wheelchairs? That's my first comment. I think we need to do, uh, we need to increase their robustness, the ramps and the lifts so that they can accommodate heavier users. The second one uh, comment was large fixed route buses. Um, I've noticed my colleagues that use scooters, meaning like a three-wheeled scooter or a four-wheeled scooter, have difficulty boarding and alighting a fixed route bus. And I know that that's a difficult thing to fix because you're trying to maneuver around the wheel wells. Um, but that's something that engineers need to consider and do their best to make our fixed route buses more accessible to people with longer, larger mobility devices. The third comment I had was air conditioning units. Um, I also ride paratransit, and those are the smaller cutaway buses. And I've noticed over the decades that those smaller cutaway buses, their air conditioning units tend to be woefully unreliable. Um, I think, I suggest, I ask that FTA do a better job um, testing those in terms of their re long-term reliability. I'm getting feedback from my maintenance people that you know they're, they're not built to last. And we need to consider that and, and do better on that one. Um, finally, the over the road buses, I ride over the road buses um, like Greyhounds. And um, I've noticed over the years that those lifts are extremely complicated to use. They have a lot of safety lockouts and there's a whole lot that can go wrong with them. Um, I've been stuck on buses. I've been left behind by buses. You know, um, it's kind of a rarity that I'm able to board or alight a Greyhound or over the road style bus without a complication. So, I, I think we need to do a better job with the human factors research on that and do a better job at making them reliable and foolproof. Thank you. Oh, oh there's one more, I'm sorry, one more, my bad. Um, we here in Jackson, Mississippi, we have um, aging infrastructure and we have terrible potholes here. Um, the one thing that I would advise manufacturers is to build these buses like you would build a tank. <laughs> uh, and if you want to uh, test how robust they are on bad street conditions, send them to Jackson, Mississippi. <laughs> we can test them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate uh, those comments. We appreciate them and we'll certainly uh, consider them going forward. All right, our next comment was from Chris Jorheim of New Flyer Industries. And 
Let me uh, unmute you. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. All right. All right, I just threw together a few uh, a few comments. Uh, first one was a uh, class of failure, like uh, especially the any like a class one, something that's going to result in extra validation miles. Uh, <clears throat> manufacturers should know that right away because really you kind of want to stop running until you fix it. Because if you're going to run extra miles, the sooner you fix it, the better. Like you, uh, and the last test we had, 1915 is a good example. It had that uh, class one reverse lunge things. Like it ran for quite a while before we knew it was a class one. And that led to a lot of extra validation miles. And that vehicle was essentially trashed at the end of it. Uh, so yeah, a little uh, more time. Uh, if it's going to be a class one, any failure that's going to result in extra miles, we kind of need to do that like really immediately or, or sooner. The next comment I had is extra validation miles. I'd like to see a more nuanced approach. Uh, again, 1915 assessed a class one failure and it was correct with a software update. But we still, we ran extra miles to me for no reason at all. At the end of it, uh, there were bits of metal bouncing around uh, high voltage batteries. Like it was, it was that bad. Like there's a potential fire risk there. And like we could, we could validate that. We could verify that work just by doing here's before the fix, here's after it works. It's a software update. Next one, unscheduled maintenance hours. Uh, I think there should be some accounting for uh, product improvement. I mean, if, it's rare that something breaks on a flyer and we don't improve it. Like if, if you're just gonna replace it over and over again then find count, count it as unscheduled maintenance. But if we fix something, uh, take a look at it. It's like, it, there's, there's things that we fix that are obviously not gonna break again. So why am I getting penalized uh, unscheduled maintenance hours? And the last one I had, it's kind of a short one. Um, the te this is in test procedure. The brake test and coast down require a shift to neutral. Uh, Siemens Alpha 3 does not like being shifted to neutral. And so it's gonna generate a stop system when you do that, just like at, high, at higher speeds. And I guess you could limp your way through, through the test, but that shouldn't count as a, a vehicle fault. Like I know it's gonna get noted in the report, had stop systems, stop system faults. Uh, but it's the vehicle's working as intended, so that kind of gives the impression there's a problem. Uh, so I don't know if the test method can be changed. I mean, all you have to do is just turn regen braking off, and that's essentially the vehicle's coasting. So you don't really need the shift to neutral. Or if you're going to shift to neutral and kind of limp through the test with the stops as faults, I don't think that should be, honestly, I don't think it should be mentioned in the report because the vehicle's working as intended. It looks like a fault. And that's all I had. All right, thank you very much. Okay, that, uh, that concludes the submissions that we received in advance of the meeting. And uh, at this point, we can open up to um, any comments that someone wants to raise a hand and get called on. Okay. Carlton Allen, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm Carlton Allen with the Transit Research Inspection Procurement Services in Florida. Um, and I just got a question about testing requirements for buses built on mass-produced chassis. I actually have a couple of questions, but uh, specifically related to testing, um, is there any uh, talk or internal dis or any discussions about uh, require the requirement of um, rollover testing? You know, uh, similar to that of the. Uh, newest FMVSS 227 requirements on the over-the-road coaches. 
Um, I think it's something, we think it's something that's uh, necessary for that industry. Um, and then this is another question, uh, is the FTA, due to chassis shortages, specifically related to mass-produced chassis, is there any discussions with these big OEM manufacturers of these mass-produced chassis to uh, assist in um, getting that supply chain back back to a more normal situation? That's that's what I got. All right. Uh, thank you for those questions. Um, if I can, can I address the, the rollover question? I'd love for you to. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, we're, we're having a, I'm consulting with our uh, advisors in the room to see if that's a topic I can address today or if we have to address it in another venue. Oh, we can discuss that. What's so the, current test? The, um, the bus testing program is not designed to be a destructive test and um, a rollover test would, would likely um, be a destructive test. Um, certainly if, if we were to, um, to measure the response of the structure um, to an actual impact. Um, we do have tests that validate the stability of the bus in dynamic maneuvering. Um, so while I agree that rollover safety is an important issue, it's probably outside of the purview of the bus testing program because we're not designed to be a destructive test. Um, as far as addressing supply chain and chassis shortage issues, that's probably a matter for other agencies, perhaps commerce. Uh, this is Mohammed Marcel, if I can comment on that. Go ahead. So th thank, thank you, Marcel, and thank you for that. Uh, um comment about um the oem chassis uh shortages um in this session we want to hear from you about the improvements uh but as uh someone who has been involved in some of that discussions i do want to comment and say uh to you that we have been in um, uh, discussions and uh, are looking at uh, uh, possible avenues uh, and the pipeline issue with regard to the shortages. Uh, um, and then uh, happy to talk offline with you, you know, but again, uh, we want to devote this session to hearing more from you all uh, about uh, the topics uh, that we have put forward uh, related to improving uh, the bus testing program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Mr. Allen, are there any um, follow-ups to that or? Um, uh, that yeah, just, uh, yeah, one follow-up. Um, I, I do I do understand that a, a destructive test may be outside of the purview of the, um, you know, the Altoona testing facility. However, um, I guess it's more of a comment. Um, is, is is FTA looking at other avenues uh, to incorporate a, that type of you know a similar standard towards these you know body on chassis uh, paratransit cutaway buses? So, and that that's all I have. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll hang on for a bit here to see if anyone else uh, wants to raise a hand. I see we've got a few questions in the chat as well. Um, there's a question from Paul Canton. Are there any plans to add a second roller to the dyno at the right distance so that OEMs could test dual driven axle 60 foot buses? Um, that is an issue that we have considered. 
uh, the expense of doing that would be considerable. Um, so we're looking at doing that. In the meantime, we have um, the ability in place to, uh, to do um, testing at other venues um, on a contract basis. Um, second question. For the maintenance hours scoring of 60 foot buses, the fail threshold is the same as for 40 foot buses. Should the threshold not be higher due to the approximately 50% additional components required? Um, it, you know, we'll, we'll consider that question. Um, the, the hour threshold is the same for um, all the classes of buses right now, from the smallest buses up to the largest ones. Um, given the different service life category of smaller buses, that's something we may wanna consider for that as well. Um, so we'll take that under advisement. Thank you for those questions. Right. And we'll uh, we'll wait as long as you know the session continues. If anyone thinks of another question that they would like to ask. All right, I see we have a question from Paul Canton. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Um, thanks for taking my question. Um, and, and I'm not uh, necessarily the most uh, informed about the topic, but it was something that we've, uh, it was brought to my attention. Um, some of the older protocols for the coast town test um, calls for, you know, putting the vehicle into neutral. Um, and for electric, you know, vehicles that with electric propulsion systems, you know, neutral is, uh, you know, the is the, putting the vehicle into neutral while while driving, you know, can pose some some challenges, I guess. Um, any considerations for um, for the electric propulsion systems during coast down and how to allow for the uh, the data collection that you need? Um. Well, that's more of a, a technical issue that the bus testing center staff um, would deal with. Um, I believe they typically, if there's a, a question about operating procedures for a particular vehicle, that they'll work with the manufacturer to, to come up with the appropriate technical solutions so that they can get, in this case, the coast down data um, within the, the design functions of that vehicle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I see we have a question from Chris Jorheim. Oh yeah, I just thought of something else here. Um, energy consumption reports. Can we uh, can we add the DC energy right now? Just AC energy is reported, and you guys do record DC. So uh, why not just throw that in the report? I think you guys do that do it that way because ultimately that's what the user is you know paying for is the AC energy out of the wall. But uh, then you're kind of <clears throat> well for the, at least for the heavy ones we all use the same chargers so different chargers would give different results. So uh, I don't know, just uh, that just, I just think DC, you're recording anyway, so I want to throw it in there. Okay. Well, thank you for that, that comment. And uh, yeah, back to uh, your answer to Paul Canton there. That's, uh, yeah, I was, uh, I was unaware that test procedures could be changed. So I would talk to, uh, talk to the guys here. Yeah. If we can leave that in, uh, 
leave that and drive and just turn regen off, that would be, uh, that would be good. Yeah, well, just to clarify, we don't routinely modify test procedures, but in an extraordinary circumstance or where the, the standard test procedure wouldn't give a valid result, you know, we'll look for the way that's going to give the most useful information to um, FTA's grantees who are ultimately the uh, customer for this information. No, no, that's good. Good, good. I will, uh, I will uh, talk to the guys here. Yeah. Thank you. Chris Jarham, I see your hand up. Uh, do you have another question or a follow up? Uh, I, I think that was the question that. Yeah, that, that was the question. Yeah, sorry, sorry. Yeah, Chris I didn't ask. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, looks like we have a couple more questions in the chat. We have a question. Could we address or mention any activity that's happening around testing driver assist systems, or is this not scope of bus testing at this time? Uh, that's correct. It's not within the scope of testing at this time. Uh, it is something we've we've talked about, and. Uh, when FTA was ready to um, propose anything, we would certainly, you know, ad, you know, reach out for stakeholder input. Um, it's not something that we're prepared to go out with um, at this time. And there's a second question here: Are the low speed? AV, I assume that means autonomous vehicle shuttles on the market tested. Um, currently, well, the definition of a bus that we use in bus testing is a rubber tired automotive vehicle used to provide public transportation service by or for a recipient. I may have gotten the order of those terms off, but that's uh, those are the key factors there. So if FTA money was used to buy a rubber tired autonomous vehicle um, that's used by a grantee to provide uh, public transportation, then it would potentially be subject to bus test. Um, we have not tested one of those vehicles to date. Um, I think the low speed AV shuttles that have been purchased, if they've been purchased with FTA funds, were done on a demonstration basis. Um, and um, yeah, so that question's done. Um, another question I understand that low speed shuttles have to receive an exemption to operate from FMVSS. How do bus testing and FMVSS relate, if any? That's a good question. Um, one of the requirements that was added in the 2016 uh, bus testing final rule was that um, the bus has to meet all applicable FMVSS before it can start testing. So um, that, that's how FMVSS and bus testing uh, relate. Um, it's largely a manufacturer self-certification that they comply. Um, if, um, okay. FMBS, NHTSA has a category, FMBS is carrying it, but, you know, street ready, low speed vehicle. Uh, was it, was everyone able to hear that? Have a, um, some of our colleagues from chief counsel's office are, are in the room here with us and, uh, and answer that question, but I'm not sure if it made it through the audio. But just let them know that uh, you know low speed vehicles are subject to FMVSS requirements. Uh, we have a comment. Uh, thank you for the thoughtful answers and public service. Well, thank you very much. We we really appreciate that.
Uh, okay, we have a question from Tyler Shipman. When was the last time the durability track damage was correlated to real world bus route damage? Are there any plans for comparative route surveys in the future? Uh, that's an excellent question. Um, there was a fairly thorough um, correlation that was performed um, in the initial years um, of the program. I don't recall if it was before the program started or or shortly after, but it, it has been a long time. And so that uh, is something that we could consider. Okay. All right. Uh, all right, we have a question from Peter Kusisto. Hope I pronounced that correctly. Do testing results differ considering different regions and weather, summer heat versus winter snow? We don't explicitly or intentionally explore different weather conditions. However, the durability track testing is performed outdoors in central Pennsylvania. And that region experiences everything from, you know, pretty intense summer heat and humidity to uh, winter snow and salt. Uh, we don't specifically measure corrosive effects because the testing is done, you know, nominally in a period of, um, you know, like um, up to about five or six months for the biggest buses and less for the smaller buses. Um, so there isn't really time for for materials durability um, in terms of corrosion to come into play. Um, but we do test in, in varying weather conditions. The fuel economy or for zero emission vehicles performance and uh, efficiency and range testing is done on the dynamometer, which is an indoor facility. Um, it's not an environmental chamber that can replicate intense conditions, but it is climate controlled. So it typically is more or less at a comfortable room temperature year round. And I see that you have a follow-up question on battery performance for battery electric buses. Um, so I think I may have just answered that. Um, the performance, fuel economy, and range um, energy efficiency testing is done on the dynamometer indoors under moderately controlled conditions. Um, and the durability testing is performed outdoors in widely varying conditions. Right. We have another question from Peter Usisto. Would it be sensible to test battery performance at differing temperatures to get a range of performance? Uh, technically, that would be an interesting question. Um, practically, it's it's more challenging. Uh, we'll we'll certainly take your question under consideration.
All right. Uh, we have a question from Paul Canton. What plans do you have, if any, to help standardize the application of the drive profiles that buses are asked to perform when on the dyno, i.e. autonomous driver or throttle brake control? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, there are technical features to assist the human driver with being as repeatable as, um, as they're able to when on the dyno. Um, we are not currently automating that function. Um, it's something that we may consider in the future. So we'll, we'll take your question under consideration. All right, we have a question from Peter Kuusisto. One of the concerns we have with battery electric buses is fire safety. It seems to be a repeat concern. Are there tests regarding risk of fire in battery electric buses? Uh, the bus testing program is designed to test the performance and durability and reliability and other features of buses under standard operating conditions. Um, the durability track does compress uh, driving in the real world um, at a nominal factor of 10 to one. Um, in other words, a mile on the durability track is like 10 miles in the real world. Um, we don't torture test vehicles to try to provoke failures of, of any particular systems. Um, FTA does have um, a low and no emission component assessment program uh, that we call low no cap. Um, you can find information about that on our website. Um, and that program is a voluntary program that's available to manufacturers of um, vehicles and components for vehicles um, to test components for low and no emission buses. And this might be an appropriate research topic for that program. We'll um, don't have any questions at the moment, so we'll be available if any appear. like to thank everybody for the um, great questions we've been getting today. These are really good and really helpful. We'll still uh, stay on for the rest of the allotted time. Anyone has some comments that they think of?
Okay. okay, I see we have another question. Uh, this is from Stuart Pennell. Some manufacturers are moving towards common platform vehicles with different driveline technologies, EV, fuel cell, diesel, all in the same main body structure. Is there any plan to rationalize the level of change between vehicles that requires a bus test to take account of this technological development? Um, this is kind of a just a, an extension of the partial testing concept that we've had since the early days of bus testing. Um, uh, in the early days, a manufacturer might test a vehicle with diesel power and then offer one with gasoline power. And given that there's a lot of similarity between those vehicles, we would only require testing for the things where we would expect significantly different data as a result of the change. So in the case of replacing a diesel engine with a gasoline one of similar weight and dimensions and power. What we would typically require on those cases would be um, repeating the accessibility test for accessibility of components under the hood, um, performance, fuel economy, noise and emissions. Those are the main areas we'd expect different data. Uh, we still look at each one in case there's some um, nuance of that particular vehicle that might require some additional testing. But that's kind of the concept that we do for partial testing. And as the choices expand beyond diesel and gasoline, first to include um, like CNG and then later EVs and fuel cells, uh, we just extend the same concept. If we think the change may lead to different data in the things that we test for, then we would uh, recommend partial testing. And if those changes would not likely result in, in something different, um, for example, we, you know, uh, we might not expect to have different information in the, um, in, the, in the hoisting test where we put the vehicle up on lifts because that's just coming from the layout of the structure and would have no effect whatsoever from the change in the powertrain. So long story short, I think we can address vehicles with a common platform and different powertrain options uh, through the partial testing regime. As a, uh, a follow-up to that last question, uh, I'd point out that 
uh, FTA in the last year introduced a new online portal for bus manufacturers to submit requests for determinations from FTA of what tests might be required on a vehicle that's had changes and also and to get authorizations to test that vehicle. Um, I think most of the manufacturers that are on the call have probably you know, either attended one of our uh, webinars about that or actually used the portal at this point. Um, if not, you can find uh, links to uh, register to use that um, and uh, information on how to do it on our FTA bus testing website, transit.dot.gov, and then you can search bus testing. Um, I'd also encourage um, anyone who's interested in bus testing or any other topic related to FTA to sign up for email alerts on uh, FTA's website. Um, from any page on our website, you can um, subscribe to email updates and, and you can either add or modify your preferences there. And uh, you receive notifications of events like this one and uh, anything else related to things that you've signed up for. Okay, I see that we have another um, follow-up written comment submitted by uh, Scott Crawford. Um, let me uh, unmute you so you can. Scott, I don't um, I don't see you in the list at the moment. Um, all right. Well, um, I don't see uh, Scott Crawford in our list of attendees. I'm sorry if you're there and I'm missing you, but uh, he has a new comment that says, "I just want to add that our colleague." commenter that raised concern about battery testing in frigid conditions is spot on. Testing battery performance at room temperature is inadequate and won't predict performance at all in low temperature conditions. I can vouch that my wheelchair batteries are high end deep cell batteries with excellent performance, but put them in 30 to 40 degree weather and yes, they will drain much faster. FTA needs to account for that as we transition to electric and hybrid electric buses. All right, thank you for that comment. Add that to our record.
All right. It seems like uh, we are not getting too many more comments at this point. Um, if you have uh, a written comment that you want to submit later, um, you can still send it to the, uh, the bus testing at uh, dot.gov address that was in the announcement. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, wrap up the meeting. And um, just want to um, thank you for your participation, uh, for your great comments, suggestions, um, and discussion. Um, we'll uh, We'll still be collecting comments at that address for a week following this event. And uh, to the extent that we're able, we'll consider comments that are submitted after that point. Um, but you know, we, we may be um, less able at, at that point, but we'll do our best. Um, thank you very much for your, for your participation and your great ideas. And um, thank you, have a great day. Um, I'll stay on the line for another um, 15 minutes to the full allotted time of this session, but unless you have further comments, you don't need to stick around. Thank you very much and goodbye. Okay, uh, we have another question that came in from an anonymous attendee. Is battery reliability and replacement cost considered in testing? For instance, how often would battery replacement happen over the life of a 10-year bus? Would that cost offset the initial cost? Um, that's a great question. It's not something that we assess um, in the bus testing program. Um, we assess the reliability throughout the duration of our test, which is designed to simulate a fourth of the useful life of the vehicle. But in reality, because it's compressed for the structural testing into um, a much shorter calendar time, tip, testing is typically done in well less than a year. So you know, lifetime over up to a 12 year life of a bus uh, is kind of outside the scope of our program. And uh, economic um, evaluation is definitely outside the scope of our program. So um, I don't I don't think the bus testing program is is the best place to address a question like this. Um, the Lono component assessment program again would be a, a better venue to um, perform, you know, so-called torture testing on batteries. Uh, to put them under like heavy electrical and you know mechanical thermal stress um, to see how they perform and um, and any particular issues that arise in that kind of service.
All right. Well, thanks to everyone who stuck it out right up until the end. Um, we appreciate everyone's participation today. Uh, this is great feedback that we're going to take uh, into our consideration for um, future updates to the program. And uh, we really appreciate your participation and great ideas. Thank you and have a great day. Goodbye.